How many of you would agree that the things out there in our universe are still way beyond the boundaries of our understanding? And the only thing we can really understand is what we can observe from where we stand. There is something that has been with every single living person every day for their entire existence that is more mysterious than any other body in our solar system and that is the moon yeah i know some of you have been waiting for this i'm telling you the number of theories about the moon is astronomical well not really but there's a lot and out of all these theories the main idea here is that this is an artificial construct of some sort now just like with everything else you have been fed an official scientific explanation that no one trusts. Not because it comes from organizations like NASA, but because the explanation given sounds like something a five-year-old kid would make up. It is absolutely absurd and defies logic. But you know what? We need to also be careful of the explanations that are provided to us by alternate sources as well. So how about we do a little detective work and see if we can't piece together this puzzle? What is the moon really? I guarantee you that the answer to that question, which is coming, will either confirm something you've always known to be true, or it will change your view of the world forever. How many of you are familiar with the Sumerian story of Tiamat? According to Sumerian texts, it was at one time a fairly large planet in our solar system, one with 11 moons. Due to the chaotic nature of the solar system at that time, one of the moons of Tiamat, Kingu, began to increase in size. Now how dare Tiamat? flaunt its big moon around the solar system. Where's the humility? Tiamat and its big moon needed to be stopped. And somehow on the basis of human morality, folks, Tiamat and its moon became a target for other pissed off planetary bodies. And it was what the Sumerians called Nibiru that came in and caused Tiamat's destruction, splitting it in two. One half was shattered, giving us the asteroid belt, and the other half and Kingu were pushed away into their own planetary orbit to become the Earth and the Moon. Now, interestingly enough, the most supported hypothesis among the scientific community today is the giant impact or whack theory, which suggests that Earth, in its early stages, was struck by a Mars-sized rogue planet. This knocked off about one-fifth of the Earth, and this chunk of molten debris, due to gravity, formed the Moon. There is co-formation, where two extremely large planetary bodies suddenly crashed into each other. They then collided again to form the Earth and a ring of debris surrounding it. That ring of debris would later form the Moon. There's the capture theory that suggests Maybe this was just some object passing by that was captured in Earth's orbit. The problem with these theories, they don't make much sense. A little sense, but not much. I mean, these scientists certainly do like explosions in space, but nothing in space moves in slow motion. So how does a very large object like the moon, which in their case is considered shrapnel from an explosion or collision, how does an object like that that was blasted off of something suddenly gets stuck as it passes by the Earth. Even if it were a chunk that broke off the Earth due to a collision, you can probably kiss that piece of the Earth goodbye. 
but nope, it stuck around to create the perfect relationship with the earth and the sun on accident. Is it not interesting that many of today's theories come from old legends? Anything that is being said about the moon folks, it's nothing new. There are dozens of tribal legends about the origin of the moon, and they are all fantastic. Then I ask myself, who gave these people these ideas? You know, let me give you something to chew on. Modern science has a bad habit of leading people to believe that we are living in the apex of technology and education of all the civilizations that have ever existed. Now, many scientists, once again, agree that at some point, the Earth was covered in water. Now, if man existed prior to this happening, then most people would agree that maybe only a small handful of people would survive such conditions. And once the conditions were right, of course they would have to survive in the rebuilding and repopulation of the planet. What do you think life was like before a global flood? How advanced do you think their technology was? You know, when something that isn't rock, like metal, is underwater for some extended period of time, it rusts. The earth takes it back. And when that sun gets to it, it gets brittle and it crumbles. And we all know that it doesn't take millions or thousands of years for that to happen. So everything that these scientists dig up, these ruins they find in pieces, do you think they have found all the metal workings? Think about it. If something like a computer existed back then, it would have most likely eroded away over the centuries, especially if it was underwater, especially if it was the size of your thumb. When you get to the level of technology where most of the global data is stored digitally, where everything is wireless and holographic, there's not much machinery to leave behind. And all the old machinery would have likely been recycled, so there would be no traces of those things, unless it were kept in a collection, unless they were trashed and buried. And even then, we are talking about the fossilization of artifacts. So it would stand to reason that if early man was perfectly capable of developing technology like ours and beyond, not the same technology, but very similar, then they would have the means to travel into space too, right? I mean, we learned about the stars from the ancients, so they would have the means to put a man on the moon as well, right? If they could do that, could they not, given enough time, build bases there? I'm talking about humans. Well, humans and perhaps the children of the fallen ones. Could they not reach Mars and build bases there? These ancient ruins, these pyramids, they're laid out like circuitry for wireless energy, a power plant. Is this why people are seeing similar structures on both Mars and the moon? I know what I'm talking about is a bit of a stretch, folks, but just look at what we are doing today. With all things considered, we're not too far off. If man is allowed to continue doing what he wants for just another hundred years, where do you think we'll be in the technology game then? Look, if something on the level of a great flood happened again, and only a few of us remained, people from the distant future would have a very hard time figuring out how we did things. Because all the digital data stored about everything would be gone. Everything would have to start again. And we repeat the same story over again. Or do we? I guess third time's a charm. Maybe people then will finally get the hint to stay off of Mars, stay off the moon. I'm sure many of you have heard legends about how the moon was brought here by an advanced race of beings. How it's some kind of ancient spacecraft. Some think it is a holographic image. Some believe it to be a flat circular object. Some think it's hollow. You know, they do have technology that can see through the moon, like ultrasound or radar. They can get an image of what's beneath the surface. The computer can take the data and actually draw them a picture. 
You've probably heard the theory about how the moon emits its own light. Well, that's not too far from the truth. How many of you have ever heard of something called moon glow? Well, due to the almost non-existent atmosphere, the elements that make up the surface of the moon become statically charged when it is activated by sunlight. It excites the flow of electrons, causing what astronauts say is a glow. The surface gets so charged, loose dust particles on the surface will actually levitate. The Apollo astronauts describe moon dust as a very clingy substance that would get into everything and magnetically stick to anything. It seems as though the moon acts as a sort of electromagnet. You know, folks, biblically, there is an explanation for the moon. And that is that it was placed here by God for the purpose of the seasons. Not spring, summer, fall, and winter, no. Seasons meaning cycles. That sunlight hitting the moon charges it up. That same light is reflected to the earth. Physical particles, radiation, that do affect the earth and everything living on it. The size and distance of the moon is perfect for not only eclipsing the sun, but for reflecting the sun at the same size from our perspective. We are talking about an object positioned so perfectly that when the conditions are right, it can give signs of seasons. Do you see? As it orbits the earth, it gets closer, it moves further away. It can create numerous signs. This one object can be a half moon, crescent moon, quarter moon, full moon, new moon. It can be a super full moon, a micro new moon, black moon, blue moon, blood moon, a super blue blood moon, like the one we are getting January 31st. I mean, who has ever heard of a freaking super blue blood moon? Blue blood? And that's the third super moon in a row. What season are we entering into, folks? Just look at how stable the moon is. Nothing moves it out of place. Nothing disturbs this thing. It's been bombarded by asteroids for only God knows how long. And we only see one side. Nothing can move this thing out of its position, even in the slightest. They've already tried bombing the thing. Let me tell you something. With everything pulling and tugging on the moon, eventually we would have seen the other side. It doesn't matter if you believe the thing rotates or not. The chances of something like this naturally forming a perfect orbit rotation, unlike anything else anywhere, is slim to none. Folks, it is there for a purpose. It was put there for a purpose. Now whatever human beings or other beings have done to the moon since its existence, that's on them. You don't have control over that. And they are not really ideas that are new anyway. And they certainly will fail more than they succeed. When it comes to simply observing the moon, there are certainly anomalies. Things fly across the moon all the time. Weird things. People see weird things on the surface. Bases, ships, creatures. A lot of that is fakery. It is to keep you from being able to tell what is real and what is not. Photos, videos, forget about it. No one trusts those things anymore. The internet is saturated with that stuff. So at the end of the day, the only thing you have left to go on is your own discernment and what you believe. My take on us landing on the moon is that, well, no one has done that in over 40 years. But for some reason, they are again planning to go back. China as well. They're already packed. Why now after all this time? I happen to think we did land on the moon. When and how, I'm not so sure I believe what was published. I think what people witnessed back then was not what actually happened. But I guess very soon, we are going to have a chance to see for ourselves if they can actually do it or not. They want to go to the moon, to Mars, let them go, see ya. In the meantime, I think we can better utilize our time by focusing on things that are more down to earth or on the things that may be coming down to earth.